Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. Presented by Spitfire Audio. I'm Kenny Holmes. Robert Kraft, are you there, my friend? I'm right here and excited to be seeing my co-collaborators and conspirators in all of it. <laughs> this is weird. What are we doing here? It's I know. It's, it's a little chilly outside. There's food in the oven. I don't know what's How do going we have on. A surprise score the podcast episode. What is going on? It must on? be the score Spitfire surprise episode <laughs> oh it, well it is black friday coming up uh this yep. is score the podcast presented by spitfire audio and um it's the off season but we wanted to do something special and we're excited to have uh this bonus episode uh with our guest emmy award-winning composer bear mccreary is going to be yep. joining us in just a bit he's a friend of the show Love if you bear. haven't heard the first episode we did with him in season two his backstory is fantastic um, but we're going to dive into some of his latest projects including uh, the latest release, Masters of the Universe Volume 2, which is out now on Netflix, as is uh, the soundtrack. So we will get to that in just a bit. But we also want to tell you about something special. I mentioned Black Friday. Spitfire Audio's Black Friday weekend sale runs from November 25th to the 30th. You can save up to 80% on packages. 80. This is a, Wait 80%. a minute. I just, I, I have to. Did you and there's say no promo 80%? code, guys. You don't even have to do it. You don't have to remember anything. Normally, we give you that one word to remember, and it's kind of hard. Uh, but this is this is a big deal. Um, get on the website now, SpitfireAudio.com. It's a great time to pick up award-winning virtual instruments, including the BBC, BBC Symphony Orchestra Package, Abbey Road 1, Albion 1, and Spitfire's exclusive Hans Zimmer range. Those are the big packages. So there's some big sales yeah. going on over there. Um, and it says here, if you spend over $349 during this weekend, uh, through bargain. 25th through the 30th, you will receive a brand new library completely free. Aperture the Stack. I saw a right, little clip of uh, some photos of this. It, it, they sent us a so picture. So badass, if I may say so. It's that record-breaking wall of sound. It's yeah. 50, 56 guitar amps. I mean, that's just insane. Four subs. It features an unbelievable selection of vintage synths and modern classics, drum machines, the Euro Rack, and guitars, all captured in the rarefied air of one of my favorite studios, Air Studios, Lindhurst Hall. The sound of this library is truly one of a kind. You know what? I'm going to just say it first. You might want to alert the media. I'm getting this. Well, and if you don't, if you miss the opportunity, they're going to be able to make it available for purchase on December 1st, uh, and it's $249. So you can see the value here. If, if you spend Pretty the $349, deal. you yeah. get it for free. It's a $250 Insane. package. Um, so go to spitfireaudio.com now. Uh, well, actually, today, it's tomorrow for when this episode drops. So the 25th through the 30th, the Black Good. Friday weekend sale from Spitfire Audio. Uh, so pick up everything to uh, get your holiday music rocking and uh, roll into 2022 with some new uh, sounds and gear. Um, Can't wait. Very exciting. And again, a special thank you to them for uh, sponsoring this special bonus episode. Bear McCreary is going to be joining us. And uh, it's it's just nice to see you guys. I haven't seen thank you. Thank you very much. We've been yeah, doing more score, though, by the way. On more, more score. score. If you haven't joined yet, more score. Um, exciting revelation. It's now available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, yeah. They have a subscription premium section now where you can do it straight through those apps if you're not a Patreon person. So I I think that's great. I, I'm actually interrupting you completely just to say. Um, <laughs> that's not I'm, like you. <laughs> I'm so eager to say we hope all of you will go to Spitfire, listen to more score, and will bear with us oh, as we tee up one of our favorites bear mccreary i'm really bear excited McCreary. guys as you can tell there's a lot of energy here it's been it's been piling up and uh thanks for joining us we're going to take a break and when we come back emmy award-winning composer bear mccreary is joining the show and also matt schrader's here so it's it's a party hey. join <laughs> us we'll be right back see you soon Hey everyone, it's Matt Schrader here, and you hear us talking about more score. We have 25 episodes now with different composers from all over the industry. We're constantly creating new episodes this off-season, so even though Score the Podcast is out of season, 
We are continuing the interviews. Recently, John Debney, Drum and Lace, Jacob Yaffe, and Rowan Hilton, Jessica Weiss just recently. Last week, we had an interview with Sebastian Zaleta, who is a music editor and composer, about how that relationship works in film music. So check it out. You get access to all of our back catalog. And if you don't have Patreon, you can go to Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe right through your app or Spotify and get our subscription through that. So check it out, patreon.com slash more score or on Apple and Spotify. Hi, this is Sarah Tank, and you're listening to the Score the Podcast. And now let's go back to the show. Welcome back to this special edition of Score the Podcast. Uh, we're really excited to be back during the holiday season. We haven't done a show like this at this time of year before, and we're especially excited about our guest. Uh, we're joined today by Emmy-winning composer and great friend of the show, Bear McCreary. Uh, Bear, since we last had you on, we were just talking about this. You've been super busy. Let me just run down these real quick. Child's Play, Ava, you got a couple of Apple TV Plus series, Foundation and C, yeah, big ones. Uh, Call of Duty Vanguard, Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica Live, which you released, and um, of course, the, the big release this week, uh, Masters of the Universe Revelation Volume 2 is out, uh, Volume 1 came out uh, earlier this year, so um, man... Uh, the the pandemic happened, but <laughs> you you kept charging through. How how's everything going on your end? And are you ready for the holidays? You ready for a break? Or oh man, oh, I don't get a break. <laughs> uh, no, I mean the pandemic was um, yeah, the pandemic was scary. You know, I I look back on uh, our trip together to New York to um, promote the movie and share our love of film music. And I actually look back on that as among the last of those types of trips that I got to make uh, before the pandemic really hit. Um, but before when the pandemic all Zoom all the time, <laughs> I know exactly. Um, but you know, I am very fortunate, uh, incredibly fortunate that I work in an as uh, um, an area of the music world that um, is still in high demand and was in high demand during the pandemic. And I think even during that time frame, people wanted escapist entertainment. People wanted to be entertained. When everybody's stuck in their rooms, the value of a Netflix show like Masters of the Universe or an Apple series like Foundation or C, it actually goes up. The demand mm. goes up. Nice. I have been um, very grateful to be busier over the last two years than I've ever been in my career which I think is a combination of a lot of factors, but I mean, you know, knock on wood, I know that is not the, s the case for a lot of people out there and especially our friends in the live music and Broadway world. I mean, my, my heart goes out to them. Right. Uh, but yeah, no, it's been an, uh, a very strange, surreal time, of course, but also a very creative and um, inspired one for me. I'm, nice. I, I mean, you listed all those great projects and, and indeed several of the things I'm most excited about, haven't even been announced yet. So it's like, there's still more stuff on the horizon that I think, um, is some of my best is some of my best work. So I'm very excited for the future and, and, uh, yeah, it's just an interesting time. Well, we can start off with masters of the universe because of the release, uh, kind of why we're here to, to launch this out for you and, and promote that a little bit. Uh, you teamed up with Kevin Smith on this. And I, I know that you were a fan of Mo two from a child, uh, as a child, and now you're doing this project. Um, I'm wondering, how did you get connected with Kevin Smith on this? And, and was he aware of your childhood fandom um, before <clears throat> presenting this to you? Was that a criteria? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, helped. these are great questions. Um, so first of all, yes, I mean, Masters of the Universe, the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe Filmation cartoon series from the early 80s was one of my first gateways into fictional fantasy worlds mm. that and star wars um the difference was as a kid especially back then this is before the internet children i couldn't go to see star wars every day oh wow i could yeah. watch he-man five days a week um <laughs> and so in a way it was like as profound even though the source material obviously wasn't as deep in the 80s as as star wars was nevertheless i had this same attachment to it and um, Kevin developed a sequel to that era of the 
um, Mattel, you know, Masters of the Universe brand, but he basically made it the way we all remembered it. And, uh, and that's what really resonated with me. Um, why did he call me? I have, I, I have no idea. I don't think they knew I was a fan. I think they were, I think the showrunners were really excited about other projects I'd done, like Battlestar Galactica and stuff like that. And in fact, on our meeting is when they found out how big a fan I was. Um, <laughs> nice. we had a meeting where we were prospectively going to work together. And normally that's when I'm, I'm very, um, cautious and i try to like make sure i read the room ask people questions like well what do you want to do what is your vision tell me about the way you see this and uh that's not what i did with kevin smith at all uh in the meeting like we started talking and nerding out and immediately i was like okay look here's what i want to do if you're going to do a new masters of the universe i want it to feel like basil polidorus's conan the barbarian nice. except he collaborated with early era metallica <laughs> and nice. i want it to feel a little bit like elmer bernstein's heavy metal and if any of those things are scary to you i'm not the guy to do your show uh which was really fun because kevin just looked at me you know we were through zoom but he just looked at me and he goes you just said the magic words and then i looked at him and i said kevin i think i'm gonna have to do your show <laughs> and that was sort of it you know <laughs> nice um, yeah, you mentioned that, that he stuck true to it in the animation. You know, they didn't go 3D with it or anything like that. It's 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 an yeah. uh, in a, a reinvented look of it, but it still resembles the old cartoon. Did does that does that, does that affect you at all when you're writing your music? The the feeling you had well, bringing the nostalgia back. What's well, it's interesting, and this was a really unique challenge, um, and not one that I'm new to. I mean, I've I've faced this several times in my career where I'm taking a beloved brand and doing something with it, with, with Battlestar, Child's Play, Godzilla, Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles is the other one where there's just an equation to be made. Do you reference the old themes? Can you reference the old themes? Should you reference the old thing? Like these are all valid questions. And, and, and actually, as I look back on all those things, I approach them very differently. Um, is it a case, case by case? Master is it a case by case situation? It is. I mean, first and foremost, can you? This isn't my. It isn't in my control. Yeah. Oh, right. Legally, can you quote it? Um, and that is, you know, um, and there's always this gray area, you know. With Battlestar, we absolutely could, and we chose not to for a while. With Terminator, I could go bump, 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 but that's all. <laughs> and I could do it twice. <laughs> oh, interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's all I could do. So I had to, you know, um, and. In the case of Masters of the Universe, it was driven entirely by creative need. And then, as it turned out, the material from the Filmation series is inaccessible anyway. I did not have the option to use the old themes. Mm -hmm. But even if I had, even in my first meetings with Kevin, I described making a score that sounds like what it feels like when I think about that old show. When I go back and, yeah. when I go back and re listen, it's a budget animation from yeah. the early '80s. Big the difference. theme is cool, um, but there's an innocence to it, and there's a library approach. I mean, there was like 20 pieces of music, maybe, in the whole show. I mean, I'm guessing. I don't even know. Hmm. But it was like a lot of recycled yeah. tracks, and ultimately, there was like a kind of, I don't know, almost disco synth pop vibe, <laughs> you know. And ultimately, when I think about Masters of the Universe, it sounds like Conan the Barbarian and Metallica. It just, that's in my brain. That's what exists. I didn't invent that for this series. It's in my brain. When I think about it, that's what it is. So I didn't really go back and revisit the show. And, and nor did I make any effort to be nostalgic for the show. The visuals, as you as as you said, Kenny, were already doing that. Yeah, and the story's definitely doing that. It's picking up right where the old show left off. It's not reinventing the wheel at all. But ultimately, it was like that weird little balancing act where I was like, ultimately, my score sounds technically nothing like He Man and the Masters of the Universe yeah. in no way whatsoever. Uh, and even just even if we were to quote that classic old theme, I realized it's like it just doesn't fit my 
my memories are so tied to that old show that I was like, the nostalgia here would be like a nostalgia overload. Uh, overload would be an overdose of nostalgia. Yeah. That ultimately, this show, which is telling this new story in, in an interesting way, it was like, I almost realized, like, yeah, I've got to do it a, a different way. Now, I'm curious, like, did any of you, especially the you guys that I think are my generation, did you grow up on Masters <laughs> of the Universe? Does this, did I make a mistake? Did I do it wrong? What do you, you know, think? I, no. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. I was just going to say it, it feels like uh, for, somehow the nostalgia aspect of this um, comes through loud and clear, despite this sounding very different. And, but it sounds heightened. It doesn't sound like it's breaking apart and doing its own thing. So that's what I thought was really cool. I think you elevated the nostalgia because like you said, the visuals are there. You still feel like you're, you're in that world, but then the music is much bigger and, and richer than what you'd expect from a, an eighties cartoon, which was Hmm. a different era and a different budget, like you said. And the accessibility at that time was, was, was much different. Um, and I know that you said on mm-hmm. Twitter, uh, you got the soundtrack album releasing soon, but you you said it features arguably your best symphonic writing of your career thus mm-hmm. far. And I, that was pretty bold. We were like, wow, of all the things you've written, you, you feel like like this is is that. Why Why do you feel that way? That's a great question. And even as I wrote it, I was like, I'm kind of throwing down the gauntlet here, but <laughs> I believe that the um you know the soundtrack came out hours ago as of this recording it is out now um and in the first five episodes of masters of the universe revelation um they're setting up all the pieces and it's five adventures that feel somewhat episodic there's a road picture kind of aspect to it we're going to go here for an episode then we go here the back five play like a single you know two hour plus movie mm. it is really epic and character driven and all those pieces that were set up are paid off um even when i read the scripts i was blown away by how good they are and i think what happened was not only did i just learn the ropes and i wrote the themes but i had more space in the back five and i was just in this zen like place of inspiration and when you get to the, the finale, the, the, the 10th episode of this work, the last six tracks, I think, of the soundtrack album are just the entire score nonstop, hmm. um, continuously. And it is so symphonic. It, it, the, the, the use of themes, the, the way that I'm putting my emotion just on my heart sleeves, it also evokes that there's a 20-minute there's a action scene that's nonstop. And I, I got to evoke those those kind of action cues that um, James Horner used to write the Genesis countdown from star Trek II, the flying circus from the rocketeer when the minute that that cue starts, you're just like all in. And it's like a, <laughs> it's like an orgasm for seven minutes. It's amazing. Yeah. That, like, M- Master of the universe revelation gave me the opportunity to, to write a cue like that. I mean, it's just like this incredible action. Um, but it's like, l- like that kind of James Horner, John Williams, lyrical action. It's action with melodies. It's not like muscular, just kind of, um, you know, Battlestar Galactica had a lot of drums and stuff. So I am, I am biased because I've heard this and no one else has. And I thought, ah, maybe I'm, I shouldn't even say that. But I also thought it would be a shame if soundtrack fans listened to the first record and heard the electric guitars and kind of went, ah, it's a rock thing. I'm not interested. That it's like, this is my tribute to like John Williams, Elmer Bernstein, James Horner, wow. Jerry Goldsmith. You strip out the rhythm section, which pops up from time to time. That's what it is. And um, and I really got to expand that for the, the back five episodes. So as you can tell, I am incredibly enthusiastic <laughs> about this. And in a way, at the risk of raising your expectations, I want to make sure people hear this stuff, that people that love the composers I just listed should give yeah. this a shot. And it's it's a vinyl release as well. Are you a vinyl guy? I I am, and uh, there is a vinyl vinyl in the works. I don't know how much I can say. That yes, ish. Probably. Probably yes. <laughs> okay. um, so yes, I'm uh, sure it'll look tank cool for, too. Tank type for news on that. Yeah. 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 Can I ask? I've actually wanted to. I've noticed in a lot of your projects that 
what you were just describing that those moments for a longer piece of music. And a lot of time people will describe it as kind of wall to wall, but I feel like that's, that puts down what the actual art form is because there's, you're kind of assembling and building up steam and momentum into something. And I've noticed that in the way I think a, a lot of the things that, that you've written, but, um, what do you look for in those moments where you can say, I, I imagine you sketch it out really early on and you say like, okay, here's a payoff. Let's go back two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is, and start to kind of lay the groundwork for what this is going to blossom into. But uh, can you kind of walk me through what you look for in those scenes where <clears throat> you actually have the ability to musically take us on a journey? I will. <clears throat> and I will start by saying my philosophy is to, write in such a way that you support the story as best you can using as little music as possible. Any scene that works without music, I do not put music in. Um, now with that said, some projects, it, they're telling me, I'm not, I'm not, I can't dictate that. I, I will watch a film or watch a television show and it just sort of tells me we need to have music all the way through here. Um, I agree with you. And I, I, I love your point that like wall to wall is very often used in a derogatory way. If not forever, it's used in a derogatory way. Go watch any of the star Wars films. The moments of silence that John Williams elected to use are few yeah. and far between and they're effective. Um, but even like, you know, even the prequel trilogy, which is like a lot of sitting around dialogue. It's like, he's right. still, He's still telling that story. And Masters of the Universe Revelation is one of those stories that just needed that kind of shape. Now, you're right. Absolutely, it's like some moments stand out. Big hero moments, big emotional moments. And the first thing I sort of sketch out is I go, well, I, I want that character's theme here. Um, how do I get there? And very often, it's just a matter of like teeing up those moments. You get that steady build. You're able to set those expectations or you ramp up and then drop out so you can sneak back in with something beautiful. I like to have that kind of, um, that kind of control over the audience's experience. Um, and again, you know, I just, I look at the way, I mean, I keep going back to just like, you know, James Horner, Jerry Goldsmith, Danny Elfman, like these are the, you know, these guys never felt, um, compelled to, like not have music they could they could have very light music um so it's it it's interesting in a way i almost feel like my hands in it are tied in a way like i don't even have a choice in that the show just tells me what it wants and that's the thing elmer bernstein used to always say he just said the movie will you watch it enough times the movie tells you what it needs is that the same um, elmer bernstein who inspired you to start everything in bellingham washington in, indeed it is one of my favorite uh, stories it, of how careers develop truly uh, i was so fortunate to to get to know him and uh and learn from him directly and and of course he was a huge influence on me just through his work um but yeah to to be able to get some of these just these little pieces of wisdom from him mm. that uh that i use e every day you know, he still helps me navigate these waters. Bear, you mentioned at one point a, you asked, you know, is there a generational relationship that maybe Matt and Kenny have uh, to some of these shows that are coming back? I would wonder the same with you and your wonderful crew of interns um, who <clears throat> I know at Sparks and Shadows, there's a big crew of, of, perspiring young composers who Berkeley grads and yeah. And do they relate to these shows? Are you introducing them to this material for the first time? Are they equally excited? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I have a, <clears throat> I have a, 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 a wonderful crew at sparks and shadows um, of uh, technical musicians and, and, and software people, composers, administrators and and really the requirement is you 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 have to be talented and love film music um and it is interesting i did wake up one day 
recently and realized like, oh, like I'm, I am not the upstart anymore, <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> and the things that I grew up on used to just be popular culture. Now those things are the things popular culture is regurgitating and recycling. And indeed for many people who work for me and, and, and support me, um, something like masters of the universe revelation is how they're exposed to masters of the universe taking that to its extreme you know i i my first test audience is my seven-year-old daughter huh. she loves the show she loves it i was showing her scenes you know i'd come in what do you baby what do you think of this you know um and uh, th so that's been really cool you know um and uh, i got her some of the little action figures and stuff so it's neat seeing that i think a work like that must thrive on its own it must um, be a work that new people watch and get into. Um, I mean, going out on a limb, I, I might say it's almost easier. The writing is so good. It's such a great show that I think it's easy to tumble into it. Um, it just through what you know of it through pop culture. Mm. If it's so close to you, you, I mean, even I watched it with the like, okay, what, uh, this is a thing that's precious to me. What are they doing? And then it's like, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm digging this. You're winning me over. You're winning me over. You know what I mean? Whereas if you, if these characters mean nothing to you, it, they're, in a way, it's almost like an advantage. It's just like, is this good writing and good storytelling? Yeah, it is. I'm in, Great. you know, well, um, who, who are they making a lot of these things for? Because they're, they're pulling these IPs from the, our generation as kids, but they're also, sort of designed for the next generation. So it, back in the day, a cartoon was made for a kid and now it's like for the parents and the kid to watch together it, almost. I mean, it's very much what you said, Kenny. It was, it was made for kids. It was look with love. I and Ken say it was made to sell toys to kids. It was a right. 20 minute commercial. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, literally designed to skirt government regulations, preventing you from advertising in that format to children. That's why at the end, all those 80s shows had that short little PSA. The whole show's a PSA. It's not an ad for toys. You know what I mean? So it, it is what it is. Um, but, you know, the other thing that was happening at that time w was, was Star Wars and nice. the idea of something that's four quadrant. Marvel movies are exactly this, you know? Yeah. I mean, you could say like, oh, are Marvel movies appealing to... People that grew up on the comics, let me spoil that answer for you. No, <laughs> they are not. <laughs> Every person who read Hawkeye comics can boycott the show. It will be a hit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. this is where that model, that like four quadrant, that's the model Masters of the Universe was, was built around. And in fact, when I say my daughter loves the show, there are parts I cover her eyes because it's graphically violent. You know, just like if you're watching Avengers Endgame, if you're old enough to understand when Nebula and Thanos is like ripping her body apart and torturing her and she's <laughs> screaming, it's like, yeah, huh? like in Empire Strikes Back when they're torturing Han Solo, you're like, I mean, I saw that when I was five, but it's like, oh, that's really dark. But that's yeah. part of the four quadrant thing. It, it's just dark enough that it hooks older audiences don't feel like it's for children. So... Yeah, in a way, you know, the material changes. and But that's what I loved about it. Like, I, um, I love doing things for kids. I think, aside from Masters of the Universe, the only thing I've done that's remotely kid-friendly is a, an animated movie called Animal Crackers. And I have another animated movie coming out called Blazing Samurai that, huh. uh, with um, Mel Brooks. Um, and uh, those are for kids. Do you know what I mean? They're kids' movies. Um, but other than that, like, yeah, I approached Masters of the Universe the same way I approached Foundation, Battlestar Galactica, Walking Dead. I'm telling a badass story with with gut wrenching emotion nice. and even some lighthearted comedy. But I want all of that to to work effectively. And ultimately, I choose projects that I like. If I like it, that's sort of where I have to draw the line. And ultimately, it's like. Do, am I worrying that people who grew up on the cartoon are going to like or not like it? N no. You know what I mean? Like it's, it inspires me and it, it gives me a, a framework in which to write the kind of music that it, that I got to write. That's, that's why I'm doing it. That's why I write film music. How it is perceived is ultimately outside of my control. 
Well, you've sold me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. If you guys haven't yeah. uh, gotten excited about this yet, you're you're listening to the wrong show. Um, you mentioned Star Wars a couple of times, and I wanted to bring this up. I'm checking out this custom paper plate Millennium Falcon you uh, put on your blog, which is <laughs> yes. so awesome. Um, oh, but man. in the last couple of years, you've written music for a Star Wars video game, and you've also done Child's Play, which Mark Hamill is the voice of Chucky, and then he's also the voice of Skeletor. I don't know if uh, you, you are co- in connection with him on He-Man or Masters of the Universe, but w- w- what is childhood bear thinking right now, like when you're, you're working on this? <laughs> st- I mean, it's, you must be going nuts as, as a kid inside of you. It's pretty crazy, guys. I mean, not only is Mark Hamill in these things, but like I wrote a song for him oh, in Child's yeah. Play that he sang. Uh, we hung out. I mean, I... I got all the stories. We figured out his his vocal range and I custom wrote something for him and got to collaborate with him and got to produce him um, to get this performance out. I mean, it was that experience was incredible because, you know, Mark had brought in this great um, personality with Chuck. He was amazing. And I was hanging out at the ADR sessions when he was recording it. And then when we started talking about the song, I remember at one point Mark turned and he sort of asked a question about, well, how would Chucky sing it? And I look back through the glass at the producers and the director. They'd been giving him all his direction for his lines. And they were sort of like <laughs> backing away slowly. And I was realizing like, oh, oh, I, I need to tell Mark this. So we started talking about, <laughs> well, let's talk about it. What's your, you know, like we started singing together, you know. And in the back of my head, I'm sitting here thinking I'm singing a child's play song with Mark, you know. It's crazy cool. Oh, that's um, great. I'm I'm living the dream, man. I mean, I'm writing music for Star Wars. I get to write music for Masters of the Universe. I get to play around with Terminator. I mean, that was a big one for me. Mm. Um, and there's there's so many more. I mean, even just getting to write music for Foundation, um, you know, was incredible. I mean, that that you know that that book series when I was a kid was such a big deal. Um, and, and yeah, and and there's, there's other stuff on the horizon too, that it's like every single one of these things alone would be like the dream come true. I could die happy saying I did that one thing. And there's so many that there's like a dozen I'm not even mentioning. Like I, I'm, I grew up being, I was a huge fan of Danny Elfman and Oingo Boingo. I mean, I, Hmm. I I am not mentioning his name enough to underline for you guys how much (laughs) of an influence he was on me. And I work with all the guys in Oingo Boingo, and I've known them for 20 years. Bartek. You know, yeah. like, I'm very close with them. Um, and and so that alone is just like, the, what? Like, like if I had told my high school self, show to take a picture and uh, from the future and say, here's a picture of your wedding. And then look at the wedding party, and I'd be like, is that Steve Bartek from Oingo Boingo in my wedding? Uh-huh. And I would be like, yeah. Yeah, it is. That's how well you know those guys. I actually saw you know? him on stage at the Bank of California playing the encore yeah. of Nightmare Before Christmas when Danny did. He still his got show. it. Yeah, it was cool. He still got it. There's a there's a score coming up <clears throat> that hasn't. Um, I think I'm on IMDb, but I haven't said anything about it. There's a movie coming out soon called This Game's Called Murder, and um, I worked with a lot of those guys, mm. and the vibe cool. the vibe of the score is very much um early proto oingo boingo mystic knights of the oingo boingo uh nice. devo synth wave like when i i like i i um that score is like the weirdest score i've ever done but when you hear it you'll be like oh this is bear getting to like go back to that stuff you know <laughs> so again like just having those opportunities to to like write in that style like man it's amazing i mean and and really that's I mean, part of it's luck, but also part of it's design. I mean, I I choose projects that give me the the opportunity to do that. I'm I'm not kidding. If Kevin Smith in our meeting had said, "Listen, the score we have the rights to the scores to the old filmation show. We want someone to do new versions of all that music," I would say, "I'm not your guy. Hmm. I don't. I, that's a great idea, but I don't want to spend time doing that. I want to do Basil Polidorus meets Metallica." You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm I'm I I'm very fortunate to be in that position where I feel empowered enough and I'm paying my bills that I I can do that. I think you've actually just you've quoted you've quoted Branch Rickey 
Um, I'm going to, do you know who Branch Rickey is? He was the first, I don't. the owner of the Dodgers in 1949. Um, and he said when asked, how was he lucky enough to have, of all the players that he uh, brought aboard the Dodgers to integrate Major League Baseball, how was he lucky enough to have it be Jackie Robinson, who is the greatest ball player in Major League Baseball? He said, luck is the residue of design. And that when we design careers and, and futures and lives, you get lucky sometimes. And you just said it. He said, you know, it's it's actually, there's a design here. And hearing your career trajectory, it's it's not a stretch to say there's a design here. You know, you getting next to Mark Hamill or Steve Bartek, the energy that brought you in front of Elmer Bernstein on a boat in Bellingham, Sometimes yeah. certain careers and artists, they either will into being dreams that come true. And I love hearing the connections that you've made that are sort of dreams come true for you. Yeah. But we didn't it, even mention Surge. Uh, we, yeah. That exactly. dropped like two days after we did our, uh, exactly. our episode with you. Was that um, Godzilla? Which was, yeah. Yeah. Was that Godzilla. was on Godzilla. Yeah. And by the way, after that, Two days after that uh, dropped, my assistant called and she was like, um, I have Buck Dharma on line two from Blue Oyster Cult. Ah. The guy who wrote, he wrote Godzilla, but he wrote Don't Fear the Reaper. Right on. So I was suddenly on the phone with this guy and he was talking about how much he loved my cover that I did with Serge. And we're working together on something oh, now. We've so actually become cool. quite close. You know what I mean? Because I was like, man, I, I'm." we were like, I'm collaborating on his stuff. He's playing on some of my stuff and that'll wow. be announced soon. But that's to get to your point, Robert, luck is a huge part of it. Yes. But then there's also the, I, th I believe that people that are successful are the ones that innately have the personality that when a lucky thing happens, they know what to do. I agree. They yeah, so that it's like oh when you have a th that when that one in a million thing happens you aren't the person who fifty fifty screws it up you know yeah, what I mean yeah. so that it's like that's why yes there's and and look I've had as much my share of missed opportunities for sure things that didn't work out but but it's also like when things do align I like to think of myself as someone who um has a positive energy has ambition has enthusiasm has passion people go oh that might work out let's give him a shot you, do you know what i mean and so, so that's that's sort of, of, of where the design kicks yeah, in yeah. it's not that all these things happen to me it's that the door cracked open right in front of me and then i am the type to go "Ooh, that door's open let's ah let's get let, let's open it you know yeah, and and that's lux a part hard of thing also, to explain. you put yourself in position yes w when that opportunity strikes Correct. it's not the lottery it, it's it's chance mixed with your huh. abilities and and well everything said. that you bring to the table yeah um, absolutely and definitely sustaining a career is not luck you know i mean that uh, and and that you look at oh, all man. the people <clears throat> we admire all the composers that um that retain a long career it's like they are definitely predisposed you don't have a lucky break that carries you for 50 years you you must be the right personality type, the right talent that every time an opportunity arrives, you know, you do the right thing. And I will say guys, like I am reaching a point in my career that I'm really enjoying. Huh. I, I used to be, I was so young. I was so green that I would, when Battlestar started, uh, I would take meetings and people would look at me and then I'd realize, Oh my God, you don't, you think that I'm, you think I'm older. Like you look at me and it's like, are you the, intern do am I, am I asking you to get me coffee oh my god you're my 10 o'clock who are you you know um and so i started i was really insecure about that and i did little tricks to make sure not to betray my age i remember at one point hanging out with a bunch of people that were you know creators on battlestar and ba back to the future came up everybody loves back to the future and i was like oh my god i love that too when i was five that movie <laughs> changed my life and the room goes ice cold and everybody looked at me and they go, we're 
Huh? Five? And he realized they were all in high school. <laughs> you know, or college. So my point is, I was a little insecure about my age and was sort of like, um, <laughs> I want to make sure that when I walk into a room, like, ah, and I have definitely relaxed nice. now. I mean, and also I'm the age, if not older than people that are now show running, producing, directing, and that's a comfortable position. But the other thing that I found just to get to that thing, that intangible thing that you're getting at, Robert, is that now my reputation precedes me in a way that is very helpful people especially on big budget television shows where the deadline is intense i mean a thing like foundation uh for whatever reason it's like i am finding that like i have an energy that's we got this like this isn't gonna be a problem you guys let's just have fun let's get inspired write themes and like the thing about oh the deadline and how are we gonna do live orchestra on all these episodes i find that people sort of it's like they relax around me that it's like oh Oh, right. Like, that's going to be okay. And I love doing that. I love being able to walk into a room and sort of try to change the energy from, oh, my God, there's all the deadlines and the budget and, uh, and the producers in the studio and just being like, let's write some cool music. Let's get a theme mm -hmm. going that everybody loves. And nice. like, it's, the, it's not, you know, the, the deadline's not going to be a problem, you know? Well, and, and that works in your benefit, too, because I would imagine if you can put the director producers at ease then you have the room to be able to say, hey, I had this idea. What do you think of this idea? A hundred percent, Matt. And that is the job. My job is not writing music. My job is putting producers and directors at ease and then writing music. Um, hmm. So it's, it, it's, I'm, I'm, I am just, I'm really enjoying that part of it. I mean, the creative stuff is great, but the interpersonal side, it, I feel like I'm helping people. It's like, it's like I'm able to like, say to them and communicate to them like it's going to be okay like you guys are more stressed than i am with all the stuff that you have to worry about running a show directing a big movie um and or or, or making a triple a video game you know and 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 so i'm i'm really enjoying that and i'm sort of savoring this this time in my career where i'm just sort of like i i'm i'm really enjoying all aspects of the job and and i and i i feel like that does become this almost like a, like a feedback loop of positivity, so you know? Great. And, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where that goes. Do you know, what's great about it is that you're aware of it because a lot of people have these moments where things seem to come together and they're so locked in an anxiety loop that they don't realize, wait, these are the moments to bottle because yeah. I suggest to you from a little experience that it, they're, there are curves in the road you couldn't possibly anticipate. So yeah. not surprisingly. So w to be aware of it and to savor it, you're you're way ahead of the game. It's just great. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. And I'm I am doing my best, Robert. I mean, there's definitely times you get you get lost in the woods and um and you you know, there's a lot of anxiety. There is a lot of pressure, yeah. you know. No kidding. But uh yeah, it's 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 you know, there's a lot of really cool things happening and even things out side of the film music world i'm i'm doing a lot of creative stuff and and exploring projects of my own and and that's been going great so it's it's a really exciting um yeah, it's just a really exciting time bear you mentioned a few minutes ago that and i thought this is kind of a stab in the dark but i wanted to put you on the spot you mentioned that when these opportunities arise in life you want to be able to seize them and uh, and make something of them. And you mentioned, I've probably made some mistakes along the way. What do you beat yourself up over that you think, oh man, I should have handled that different. I would have been on such and such show or such and such movie or, you know, a meeting that didn't quite go the way that, that, uh, that it would have. Is there, are there those things that stand out to you as, ah, oh, crap, I, I, it's, almost painful to revisit because i should have done it differently that's a great question <clears throat> and uh you know the answer is of course yes um but do i beat myself up over it no because i am where i am and that was part of my journey to get here i think you know to to tell the story quickly um i um 
came from a place of pure art and pure passion. And I studied and worked under Elmer Bernstein. The business side of the business is not something I knew anything about. Elmer mm. wasn't dealing with the business we are in now. Even when he was in it, he wasn't dealing with it. He got to do it the old way. <laughs> you mentioned So <laughs> as I emerged into the business, um, I look, I'm, I'm rather passionate about the things I talk about. This is not a surprise to you. After Battlestar, um, I entered a phase of a couple of years in my career <clears throat> where I just started swing and a miss, swing and a miss, swing and a miss, yeah. um, over and over and over. And, uh, finally I, I had a few people in my life really bluntly say one of them was after a meeting, just a, just a general meeting with somebody. Um, a friend of mine called me and said, well, what happened at that meeting? And I go, what? It was great. And they go, well, they, they said you were a total narcissistic jerk. Huh. And I was like, what, what? And that happened twice in the span of like, you know, a couple of weeks that it was like, what is up with this guy? He's got the biggest ego ever. Well, here's what was up with me. I am so passionate mm. that when I come to you to talk about your project or your life or whatever, I am just exploding with ideas for how to do it. Because I thought, well, that's what you want, right? You want to hear ideas and you want, obviously, someone that's going to be so into this thing that they're right, like already you're hiring someone. Yeah. You're already miles ahead and like, oh, do this, do this and this. Well, that's not a good idea. And that's not what <laughs> anyone is looking for ever. Um, and actually, I, I, it really, it was a punch to the gut. Like, what? I had no clue I was coming across that way. So this was now I'm turning 30, 31, 30, maybe. Crucial era in one's life. Um, and I, so I made an effort to change that. And I just started changing the way I interact with people. I started changing the way I talk with people. I started holding some cards close to the chest. Yeah. In a meeting, I can sit down and I know exactly what to do. I even know, I know how to solve your problem, but I'm not going to say that. I'm going to sit down and we're going to, I'm going to get to know you. I'm going to find out how you think, what makes you tick, where are you from? What are your kids' names? Then I'm going to say, what do you want to do? Then people tell you what they want. Nine times out of 10, it's what I was going to do anyway. And then I go, yeah, that's a great idea. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's this is yeah. like conversation 101. It's the same thing, just a different approach. Yeah. It's why I said yeah. when I met with Kevin and I just came out of the gate and was like, I was an asshole. Kevin, this is what I'm going to do. The reason I told that story is because I don't do that anymore. But with Kevin, I felt empowered to do it because we just got along so well. Well, here's what happened. Okay. Um, right around that time, I was, uh, I was fired off a big project, um, fired off a couple projects, but fired off a big one. And, uh, it was right at that time that I was realizing like, Whoa, do I have like an attitude problem? And for what it's worth, the project I was fired off of was not because of an attitude problem, quite the opposite. I had a major figure on that, um, uh, screaming at me for two hours the day he met me. Uh, he was, I was, came in for a spotting session and for some reason, he thought I would have scored the entire project already. Like, I'm meeting him, and he's telling wow. me how I failed because I haven't finished the music already. And he yelled at me for two hours in a crowded room of strangers. And for yeah. two hours, I just... This was right around the time that I was like, rethink how you deal with people. So I was like, okay, well, sorry that that happened. I'm sorry I let you down, but I'm here now. How about we spot your thing? Anyway, I survived this onslaught and eventually got you know fired. But one person in that room who had met me knew nothing about me other than the fact that I kept my cool, uh, mm. hired me on a project the next year mm. based on that alone. And that project ran for years, paid my bills, kept the lights on. It was great. It was a huge win. And that was one of those times when I was realizing like, you know, how you treat people is a hundred percent of the job. And even when you are being mistreated in that context, it's like, I'm going to just keep my cool and like, just tell this guy, I'm sorry, man, that you feel that way, but I'm here now. Tell me, let's, 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 let's score your thing. And the person that watched, I mean, people told me later, they were like, oh my God, they felt sorry for me. But yeah. you know what I mean? That it's like, that was the beginning. That's super interesting. That comes on the heels of this kind of 
inner debate that you're having with yourself too. Like this is this is the you know the trial that you have to go through, the yeah. gauntlet you have to run in order to try to make this change. And this is the thing, Robert, you were getting at, like, that is it magic or is it design or is it just luck? I'd come out of a stretch of, like, you know, a lot of misses and r- about a few months after I had sort of said, man, I'm going to straighten up and fly right. And I'm going to just, I'm going to make sure people understand my energy is my enthusiasm, mm. but I need to, like, make sure they understand I am humble when it comes to tell me what you want to do on your project. It's your project. If I can thread that needle with and not, and be true to myself, then I think I can make this work. Three months later, I, sorry, go ahead, Robert. Please finish your thought. Three months later, I get a call from David S. Goyer, um, Mm. on a show called Da Vinci's Demons. And he even says right out of the gate, he's like, my two usual guys are unavailable. Mm. So you're my third choice. I hope that's okay. And I was like, that's great. You kidding? I've always wanted to work with you, which is true. He's written, he, you know, he wrote Blade, yeah. he wrote Dark City, you know, forgetting even like the, uh, the, the, the Dark Knight movie. I was like, man, I've known this guy's name for, you know, 15 years. Well, it's so like said, right out of the gate, I mean, you know, we bond instantly. The first thing I. Oh, are we on a delay? We might be on a little bit of a delay. The, what were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say that you you, you had uh-huh. mentioned that oh, long- wait, delay. <laughs> so like you said, longevity. Like, longevity what? And then Kenny dies. So I think. Oh, sorry, sorry guys. Here. What were you saying about longevity? Yes, in that the pause. You mentioned that had longevity. longevity isn't uh, luck uh, in a career, and it, it's it it seems like oftentimes when someone gets fired or something goes bad, it seems like it could be the worst thing of your life. But moving ahead, if you figure out how to fix what happened there and move forward with it, it often rebounds into the best part of your career. And th- I, we hear those stories so much. And those well, are the I people that absolutely. succeed. Yeah. We all know fundamentally and all work on personally the area of show business that is never mentioned enough, which is the politics. It is, mm-hmm. you know, you can have be the most skilled skilled bass player on the planet but if you are a fill in the blank in the band or on the session you don't get called back and nobody understands wait man i thought that guy was great yeah but you realize what a pain in the neck he is yep move that to composer cinematographer writer it's really you know it's what i always say it's the equation between attitude an aptitude that if you have absolutely if you have ability and you're nice and i famously wrote about that at one point in some magazine and it comes back to me it just came back recently i saw that editorial you wrote about attitude and aptitude and how i credited a an arranger on a mambo record with being the best arranger i've ever worked with in my life and utter humility like is this okay and is there anything more you wanted me to work on? And I thought, wait, this guy's the nicest guy I've ever worked with and the most humble. Yeah. And he also <laughs> is crushing it. How can I find that in everybody I work with? I think that's a fabulous because we found it in Bear. Somebody <laughs> who's great and nice. And he can a sell really his projects. Lethal. Learn from yes. that, people. <laughs> and I hope the people well, that and- work for you are getting this lesson because they think it's about, you know, how do you make a minor seventh chord work against an E natural when you're in it's mm, there are a lot of people that know that one day you guys will definitely interview at least one person that had come up from my camp as they are now, many of them are starting to move out on their own. I do. I'm not going to speak for them, but I will say that to work for me, I don't, I don't have a lot of contractors that come in and out your salary. You work, for me and i catch them all right out of school they don't work it for anybody else um and i it you 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 get my philosophy and if and and that comes with dramatic interpretation the politics interpersonal music all of it like i really try to share with everyone all those things that are what are necessary to survive and thrive in this business it's not just the creative And, and indeed, you know, ultimately to finish my story, I fixed my attitude and my career exploded. 
Hmm. Da Vinci's Demons, I won an Emmy for it. The first thing I wrote for David was the main title theme that I won an Emmy for. And David is David's the showrunner on Foundation, you guys. That's why I'm doing oh, Foundation. Because of man. that guy. You know what I mean? And 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 it's like and then even, you know, Ten Cloverfield Lane came up right after that, and Godzilla came up right after that. And and it was interesting how so you know, it gets your point, like, is it luck or design that like I was missing out on opportunities. I was coming across in a way that I didn't realize. I fixed that, and then everything got better. Maybe it was luck, but I, I also think that it, a huge part of it was that I was missing opportunities because I would walk into a room and I would give someone the wrong impression. Mm. Um, and now I generally don't, although I, you know, I am still probably an acquired taste. My energy level is what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but, um, but yeah, no, and I it mean, it was a I, risky move on, uh, with Kevin Smith. <laughs> it was, but I got to say the other thing I did, but it's say, what you wanted to do. It yeah. is. And also I felt like in 30 seconds, I was like, I feel like I've known Kevin Smith my entire life. Mm. Like we we're very close now. And it was, yeah. we just hit it off so fast that I was like, I'm going to go out on a limb here. And I would be surprised if that's not what he wants to hear, you know? And in fact, here's, what's great about Kevin Smith. I said, I want it to sound like Conan the Barbarian. He starts singing. The B team <laughs> from the main nice. title awesome. of Conan the uh, from Conan the Barbarian, and I start singing it with him, and we just sing the whole thing together, and that's when I was like, "All right, we're pals," you know. <laughs> that could have went it's the awesome. other way too. He could have been like Conan. Yeah. I don't. I've never seen that. I don't. Maybe we go a different direct. Like that was one of those things where you threw yeah. a dart and hit. But the also, yeah, exactly. It's like exactly, but it's also a, yeah a little bit of a litmus test, you know. Like if you yeah. don't know what Conan the Barbarian is, then we're we're not going to get along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we wrap, we always like to ask uh, our guests, and we, we it's been a while since we've talked to you. Um, you dropped Battlestar Galactica Live as an album, but um, now that things are starting to move and wheels are turning, are, are you going to do any sort of concert? That's kind of the new thing now. Uh, yeah, the, the new thing that I did 12 <laughs> years ago yeah. for many years. Um, yes. Uh, wow, that sounded super snarky. Uh, no, it's, it's <laughs> awesome. I love how much that has taken off. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I would love to, um, there's definitely, uh, some things, there are things in the works that you will be able to see me perform live, uh, in the next year or so. I'm, I'm planning something very special and very exciting. Is it going to be Battlestar Galactica live? I wouldn't hold my breath for that. Um, not to say that that might not be part of it. Um, but I'm, I miss getting out in front of crowds, you know, and, and especially now that there's more of an appetite for that kind of music and, and especially coming out of the pandemic, um, right. you know, I, I miss being in front of an audience. I mean, that was such a crucial part mm. of my creative life. When I was on Battlestar, I would score a season and then do live shows for the summer while they were shooting and then get back into scoring. I mean, that was like my, my cycle for four years. Um, and uh and yeah i miss that so there, there's some really exciting things on the horizon great exciting very cool very cool well bear mccreary thanks for joining us uh right before the holidays i I'm, it's a busy time and and also a good time to to step away so we appreciate your time uh doing this and uh for our listeners um as always you can follow us there's a number of ways twitter at score the podcast instagram at score movie Facebook score a film music documentary. And if you haven't checked out more score yet, it's on Patreon. It's on Apple podcasts. It's on Spotify. It continues on. There's no off season. There's uh, dozens of episodes already up and more to come with uh, composers and hangouts and everything and uh, exclusive merch. So go check that out. And uh, thanks again to our sponsors, Spitfire audio for sponsoring this extra special bonus episode with bear McCreary. Go watch so masters of the universe volume two out now and pick up the album as well, which, uh, was released and and awesome i wish all of you great longevity indeed <laughs> word of the day word of the day indeed Man, thanks so much thank you Man. gentlemen Thanks again to everybody for checking out this episode. Uh, we're See you we're next happy to time. be with you during this holiday season. And um, again, don't forget the Black Friday weekend sale, Spitfire Audio. Save up to 80% on some of their packages. And if you spend over $349, you get that new package um, that 
is a value of 250 bucks. Um, if you, if you miss it, it's available on sale, uh, starting December 1st. So go over there, support those guys. They support us and we appreciate them. We love our partnership with Spitfire Audio. And that's sale Audio. November 25th through 30th. Don't miss it. For that special. Thanks for listening and uh, get over to more score. Get caught up. A lot of stuff coming up and uh, we're excited yeah. about all of that. We'll Thanks see you guys over there. for your continued support. Score the podcast. We'll see you soon.